I see the Zoom technology is working and people are being allowed into the room. Um, I'm happy to be able to uh, introduce today our uh, speaker, our first international speaker of our speaker series, <laughs> um, Dr. Peter Malinowski. Um, as I may have mentioned at one of our previous meetings, I was, I, I've been uh, contemplating on the wisdom of uh, really bringing in perspectives from uh, other countries. There's so much really good work going on in regards to the, uh, the mechanisms by which mindfulness seems to uh, exert its effects in the brain and the mind and emotion and social functioning, um, not just from America, but also from Europe, from Asia, um, even some now coming in from the Middle East. Uh, so as part of expanding our circle of uh, kind of understanding and, um, and uh, really um, bringing in perspectives uh, at the forefront of understanding mindfulness and my mindful, mindfulness science. Uh, I'm going to be inviting a few people from other countries. So Dr. Uh, Peter Malinowski is uh, an associate professor in cognitive neuroscience and directs the meditation research lab, part of the research center for brain and behavior at Liverpool John Moores University in the UK. He's also co-director of this research center and director of the Masters in Science program, Positive Psychology and Wellbeing. Uh, Peter's been doing work in this field for over 10 years and has quite a number of uh, publications in looking at not just the clinical efficacy and psychological impact of mindfulness and related practices, but the neural mechanisms that may underlie these effects. And once again, thank you so much for being with us today. And I'm going to turn it over to you now and stop my screen share and you can begin yours. Okay, so uh, good morning, everyone, or well, wherever you are here, it's good evening. So I have a full day of work uh, behind me already. So it's, it's a pleasure to round it off in this way. And thank you so much for this uh, invitation. I mentioned before in the moment, actually, that I, when I got the, this email, I was really excited because I, I know Ralph's work a little bit and it's a great inspiration for some of the work I or we are we are doing here, especially the EEG work. And well, it's a real pleasure to to share a few of the insights we gained and focusing on, on some aspects of, of the work we have been doing here over the years in in Liverpool. And I think I will start sharing my screen now. Looks good. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so the um, what I would like to focus on today is actually what also is one of the key perspectives that I take in 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 my research regarding meditation and mindfulness, and this is to consider attentional and metacognitive uh, processes of meditation, in particular mindfulness meditation. I would like to to put this a little bit into into context and so just to um, maybe to share some of the findings you may, you may know already that there were a few surveys that uh, tried to see how many people in the US and in the UK are actually practicing mindfulness meditation mindfulness based uh, programs and things like this and in the US, this was based on the na uh, National Health Interview Survey and fr on, from the data from 2012, the estimate was that about 2% of the population in the US are practicing mindfulness or have been practicing in the last 12 months. By two, 2017, this were already 5%, so more than double in, in just a few years. And in the UK, 
in 2018, uh, a different survey was um, was conducted, and based on this, it was estimated that around 15% of the population in the UK have been practicing mindfulness over the last 15 uh, over the last 12 months uh, during the last year, so to speak, and. I think that's actually quite interesting. I was quite surprised that so many people, meanwhile, have uh, have heard about it and are actually engaging with, with mindfulness. 15%, I think it's quite substantial. But th this survey, it actually went a bit uh, further. This It was carried out by uh, researchers from Oxford University here. They also tried to, to get a sense how these these people practicing mindfulness how they actually learned it here in the uk and what we see here is the percentage that that the participants responded to this question how they learned mindfulness and what you see is that the majority 35 percent learned mindfulness through an app 34 percent through a, a book and i would say just only 24% through a, a course. So just about, the, maybe just to mention briefly, the numbers here in percentage add up to more than 100% because the participants were able to, to indicate the sev several ways they, they learned about mindfulness. But the key thing here is that only 24% learned mindfulness through a course and I would, or the other way around, that the majority of people who learned how to practice mindfulness meditation learned it without direct human contact. And in a way, this was um, quite, a, quite a revelation to me. I had no idea that the, that the proportions were, were so extreme in a way. Now... Um, so if we think about mindfulness-based programs and the research around it, and I mean, probably you are all quite aware that, that, that we have meanwhile quite strong evidence, depending a bit on, on the specific field, but growing and quite strong evidence that the different mindfulness-based programs, in particular MBSR and MBCT, mindfulness-based cognitive therapy, can be quite successful, quite, quite effective, can make quite a big difference you know, so to, to the life of people, we, you know, to their health and well-being. So, what, so we know this quite well for, for several uh, conditions. This, it's quite well established. Meanwhile, what we do not know so well is actually how these benefits, how these positive changes really come about. Now, one can say for mindfulness-based programs, as long as they are effective, as long as we see clinical benefits and so on, we don't really necessarily need to know how they come about. You know, so if you just say, okay, I use the program, it makes a difference, that's it, fine. And maybe to some extent from a clinical applied perspective, that's okay. But it, if I look at this slide and if I consider that the majority of people who learn mindfulness don't learn it by taking part in such a well-structured, man often manualized uh, course, but download an app and, and do one or the other thing on an app, read, read a book, go to a website or whatever they are doing. Then I, I would think the, the question I am anyway particularly interested in uh, how the change comes about what the actual mechanisms of mindfulness are becomes even more important. So, if, so if, as long as participants uh, take part in a full mindfulness uh, program, they probably will encounter the majority of these different components of standard mindfulness-based programs. And I, I list some of the key components here, but if if the if the people only encounter uh, 
an app or read a book or so we have no idea what exactly they take from it and what they practice and and then also how much benefit they might get out of this so from this perspective i would say it becomes even more important to understand what the active ingredients are what what really drives the positive change that meanwhile is so well established i would also say for me at least that when we consider the standard mindfulness-based programs, it is also useful to understand really how they work, what the contributions of these different components are and, and so on, but maybe less urgent compared to this insight, this, this um, understanding that people may just pick this or that component and, and run with it. Uh, uh, thinking that it might be beneficial for them. So to cut, to cut a long story short, the, the question for me would be what really works when, when we practice mindfulness? What are the active ingredients? What mechanisms really make the differences, uh, the positive differences that we do observe? One way, of course, of looking at this is uh, by considering the different uh, models, mindfulness models that have been proposed. There are quite a few, and I only list here some of them, maybe some of them, the most well-established, the most popular ones, from, starting from 2004 by Bishop et al., where a consensus panel came together to, to discuss what here within psychology or more in, in the scientific field in the West, what would we mean with, with mindfulness and they as, as many of you, or maybe everyone even will know, they, they propose uh, two uh, key components, self-regulation of attention and orientation to experience. Then Shapiro et al., they ex expanded this a bit more in, in addition to this, these two components, which they then call attention and attitude. They, they emphasize the third component, intention, so the, that we also pay attention in a purposeful way and intention also more widely that basically participants who take part in or engage in mindfulness meditation, that they have a certain purpose or intention and expectation to get something out of this. So the, I think this is a very useful and a very often applied model than probably less, uh, less well known is the model by uh, Alan Wallace and Shapiro that, that tries to combine Buddhist understanding and psychological understanding and proposes uh, that it's about the balance in these four areas that I list here, conation, attention, cognition, and emotion. And then another uh, model by Hölzel et al., also suggesting four components, attention regulation, body awareness, emotion regulation, perspectives on the self. So, different propositions and there are more models out there than those uh, but I think these are some of the very prominent ones and what I think is is quite obvious here that in all of these models and hopefully this doesn't surprise anyone but in all of these models attention is mentioned as a key component so from this perspective so if we just look from the perspective of uh, psychological science if you want then, then attention is mentioned again and again as a, as a key component. But as you all know, the mindfulness-based approaches, in particular the one that John Kabat-Zinn developed, it, it, it uh, takes uh, meditation practices out of, the, out of a Buddhist context and repackages them in a in a Western scientific uh, way. Yeah, so it may make sense also to briefly take a look at how, how the, this approach to meditation, to mindfulness is um, seen from, from the Buddhist perspective. I'm not going into many details, but I just want to reinforce the point that I'm, I'm making already. And, and there, one of the key concepts that is discussed is or considered when it's about meditation is shamatha. Yeah, and you probably many have heard about, about this. And um, so shamatha is a Sanskrit term. If we translate it, it's, it 
it's usually is translated as calm abiding or quiescence. And we may say that shamatha means as a state of mind, a serene attentional state in which the hindrances of excitation and laxity have been thoroughly calmed. If you're interested in this, in particular, the work by Alan Wallace, he, I think he, well, I, he wrote a whole book about it. I think it's called The Attention Revolution. So, so where he goes into uh, much, uh, much detail uh, there and, and develops it further. He also has short, shorter articles about this topic. That's, it, they're quite um, insightful, I would, I would think. Yes, so shamatha is a very central aspect of, of Buddhist meditation practices. So if we call it calm abiding shamatha, or in Tibetan Buddhism, it is called shine, to abide in peace. So the most straightforward approach of shamatha meditation is uh, meditation on the breath, and <laughs> nothing surprising there. So where one takes the breath as an object, but in shamatha meditation, like actually any object is possible. I think a very popular object is also this, a carpet, you know, so when people sit on the floor, uh, gazing downward and just focusing on a spot on the carpet. And so I, I'm using this, well, for, uh, out of personal experience, I've meditated a lot focusing on the, on the carpet. But just to convey that in the end, it is not about the object. You know, so it is not about the breath. It is not about the carpet. It can be any object, the object in, in this calm abiding shamatha meditation is just meant to be an anchor or, or a focus for one's attention. In, in Tibetan Buddhist meditations, for instance, also different Buddha forms are used. They have also other meaning, but one aspect of it is also the shamatha on, on the Buddha form, you know, where, where the mind calls such a form or where, where the meditator calls such a form to mind and then rests the awareness on this form and in this way also stabilizes the mind. Now, this, this is a very central aspect, but if we look into uh, meditation instructions there and or uh, then what we often find, right, regularly find, is actually, uh, if you want, the health warning that uh, just shamatha or calm abiding meditation on its own can be dangerous or at least insufficient and dangerous in the sense that it that it can feel too good that it's uh, too, that it is too pleasant if one really uh, gets deeper into the practice so and as a positive psychologist i would say well what's the problem with feeling good uh, when we meditate uh, but the point here is from the buddhist perspective uh, this shamatha calm abiding meditation is uh, just seen as a platform for something much more important and this is what they what is usually called insight or vipassana in sanskrit or in tibetan laktong so it's about uh, we may want to translate it as as penetrating seeing or as deep insight insight meditation or something like this so it's about developing or gaining real insight into the nature of experience. And for instance, in Theravada Buddhism, you will often hear references to th these three characteristics. So insight into impermanence, insight into the suffering or unsatisfactoriness of experience, or, and also insight into the lack of a really existing self or insight into no self if one comes to mahayana buddhism one may hear something like uh, in understanding or insight into ultimate bodhicitta the enlightened attitude basically where it, one realizes that deep wisdom cannot be separated from compassion for all, all sentient beings yes so um from this there actually then the shamatha is uh, in Buddhist practices is somehow always combined with inside meditation, either in the in the same meditation or along the meditation path as as the meditator develops. Yeah. So 
so we have so this is uh, in a way from from both perspectives now if we're zooming in a little bit more i found this this quotation here by a great indo indo tibet master asanga i found it quite useful as, uh, and meaningful as a especially as a cognitive psychologist where he wrote in the uh, pro approximately in the fourth uh, century Mindfulness and introspection are taught for the first, for the first, this means mindfulness, prevents attention from straying from the meditative object. And the meditative object can be all kinds of objects, while the second recognizes that the attention is straying. Yes, so we have mindfulness and introspection. And so the the Sanskrit terms here uh, would be smirti, that is usually, or sati in Pali, that is usually translated as mindfulness. And then samprajnana, that is translated as introspection. Yeah, so if we are looking at, um, at these terms, smirti, mindfulness, it also means that um, to sustain attention on an object without being distracted, and then samprajnana, the second component there, introspection, or the reflective knowledge of one's own bodily states. And um, we may also say meta-awareness or metacognition. And so if we think about this, basically what I, what I try to do now is to first talk about mindfulness from a scientific, psychological Western perspective and highlighting how important attention and attention regulation are fr from this perspective, how central they are to all the different models of mindfulness mechanisms. And now if we zoom in a bit on, on the Buddhist understanding of meditation, we, and in particular with this quotation, we, we see again that attention, sustaining attention, and then the aspect of, re, of introspection, of knowing about one's own mental states, on attentional states included, yeah, that these are very important aspects. Now, if we think a little bit about the meditation practice itself, so maybe in a, in a simple way, but I think in, in a fitting way, we can think about it in this way. So we, we sit in some form, maybe in this way or another way, it doesn't matter so much to and focus on an object as we meditate. Let's say we focus on the sensation of the, of the breath. Then, yes, yeah, so maybe start here on the top, uh, focus on, on an object, then sooner or later the mind wanders off, some ideas, some memories, some things we still need to do, some thoughts, yeah, the mind wanders in, in some way, and, and then sooner or later we recognize that our mind has wandered off, then yeah, we would try to, to let go of whatever distracted us. So, so we recognize that we were distracted, we let go of the distraction and we shift the focus of attention and or we return to the object. And no, then we do it again, focus on the object, mind wanders, recognize mind wandering, let go, return to the object and again and again and again. And so, we know, I'm not going into the details here, but we know that the different cognitive functions are involved in it. There's also some neat research in particular by Wendy Hasenkamp and co-workers from 2012 that actually shows the brain networks that are involved in this process as meditators go through the different phases. Yeah, so it's not only an experiential aspect, it's not only the instruction of meditation, but meanwhile there's neuroscientific evidence that meditators really go through these different steps. And I think also from a practical perspective of someone who teaches meditation and or someone who engages in meditation understanding that it's such a circular process makes a lot of sense so maybe yeah if we don't fully understand maybe we might have the feeling that that the mind gets distracted and we recognize the that the mind has uh, wandered off is the, especially the distraction that it's a failure of the meditation. Yeah? So that actually something goes wrong there. But 
if we understand the circularity, then we actually see that each time the mind wanders off, we have the opportunity to recognize it, to let go, to return to the object and focus again. Then the mind wanders off, or wanders off and the whole process goes on again. So each time this process goes on, yeah, each time we go through all these steps, all the different cognitive processes and brain networks that are involved in it actually get activated and the assumption is, our assumption is that as a result, actually these cognitive functions and underlying neural networks, that they actually get strengthened and become more effective. Yes, yeah, so in this sense, actually what might be seen as a failure or, or just a destruction in meditation is actually part of the training and should allow us to become more efficient yeah, and to, to develop more efficient cognitive processes. And this is the, the key question that we have been asking ourselves or, and uh, investigated in the research that I'm, that I'm going to share with, with you now. Yeah, so, and the, the first question we investigated, well, it was not the first, but the first question that I, I share with you here is actually following directly from this. Um, does mindfulness meditation improve sustained attention? So can we actually really um, show that people who meditate regularly, in, even just in the very simple way, as I just described in the previous slide, focusing on an object, let's say focusing on the breath, recognizing distraction, letting go of this distraction, returning to the object and this over and over again, does this really improve sustained attention? There were a few studies be before already uh, with mixed results, some showed quite clear improvements, some showed uh, not so clear improvements and so on. So, but I, I just today, I, I just want to focus on, on the studies we did and what, in all, all of the, uh, the studies that I'm going to share with you now, almost all actually, not all, but most of them, um, what we did is we worked with uh, novice, me novice meditators, so people who had never meditated before. We instructed them in simple mindful breath awareness meditation, basically what I just explained, and asked them to practice this for a few weeks. Short, the shortest study was three weeks, the longest study, 16 weeks. So all the data that I'm going to show you in a moment are data of people who had never meditated before, then meditated for a few weeks. Yeah? So the very, very initial stages of developing some meditation proficiency, if you, if you want to call it like this. So the first question here, now it's, it's about sustained attention. And what I say here is it is about transfer to outside of meditation. Yeah? So the people meditate, but what we are measuring are, is basically what happens when they engage with, with certain cognitive tasks that, for, in this case, for instance, here, a test sustained attention. And later, I'll also show you a few other tasks. Yeah? So training during meditation, but the tests outside of meditation. I mean, that's what we were interested in here. And the, the first study I'm going to share, this is where we had um, participants for eight, they practiced for eight weeks yeah, and with uh, one mm, meeting, group meeting of one hour per week, just to keep them on board. And we had the control group that who engaged for the same amount of time in progressive uh, muscle relaxation. And, and we tested them on the following task. And I'll explain this in a moment while, and this will be true for, for all of the studies, almost all of the studies I'm going to show you while also recording their brain activity with EEG. So the task we, um, we gave them here is a so-called multiple object tracking task. And I'll explain it now. So in each repetition of this task, first the, on the computer screen, just a fixation cross appears as here. And then over time, after, after uh, 800 milliseconds or so, a bit uh, a varied lag, then actually 15, this is just a schematic, 15 dots appear 
on the screen and between two and five of these dots or circles, they are marked in red. Yeah, And these markers, they tell the participant these two to five dots, here in this case three, or circles, these should be uh, attended to, so far so good, but then actually the, the marks disappear, so the dots become white again, and now it gets interesting, these dots start moving around for about eight seconds. Yeah, so 15 dots just moving wildly on, on the screen, random directions and so on, all of the same color. And then after the eight seconds, one of these dots is marked in, in green, in a different color. And the question is, was this one of the dots that you were asked to track? So one of these dots that were marked before in, in red. So I can tell you this is a quite demanding task. If you don't pay attention, if your attention slips just for a moment, you have no chance. Once, once you, the, the do, a dot slips from the focus of attention, it's gone. There's no way of recovering it. They're all white. They're all of the same color. So in addition, what we did, and in a moment I explain why, all the, all the dots, they were flickering on and off, so they go black and white, black and white, with a frequency of 11 hertz, so 11 times per second. And this is what we used, uh, and this is what we then recorded with EEG, and uh, it's, it is a so-called steady state visual evoked potential. And basically here, we, I just show which of the electrodes, we had 128, but these electrodes at the back of the, of the head, this is where this signal that comes from the flickering stimuli is strongest. This is based on a long line of evidence starting from 1998. And this is actually where I, re what, I was not involved in this study, but several other studies using the same technique afterwards. But this was the first that really showed that here, just to briefly tell you here with EEG, the participants were asked either to attend a row to flickering LEDs in the left or in the right visual field. Yeah, and so, and these, and what we see here is actually the time course of the brain response. And the interesting thing is that actually the brain response, the steady state potential, that it increases when the same object is attended compared to when the same flickering object is unattended, the, the lower line here. Yes. So we have a very close coupling of visual attention with, uh, with this brain, brain response. So we see it as an indicator of how well people really pay attention to, uh, to, to an object that is marked by the flickering. This can get quite sophisticated. For instance, here we had a study where there were random dots in red and blue, and we asked the participants to either attend to the red or the blue dots, and they can actually selectively do this. Yes, so when they're attending to the red dots, then actually the, the frequency of the red dots is increased when they're attending to the blue dots, the, the frequency uh, or the brain response with the frequency of the blue dots, dots is increased. So it's a very good uh, way of measuring the, the spatial attentional deployment. And this is what we, why we are using this. So back from this background data now to the study, I want to briefly show you how, hold on, how this actually, mm, now I'm just losing my cursor here. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so how this um, actually looks like on the screen. So maybe we can run through a few trials just to get, give you a sense of the difficulty. So now, because otherwise on, with a visual presentation over Zoom and so on, it doesn't really work, I removed the flickering. Yeah? But imagine it would be even a little bit more difficult if the dots would be flickering. But okay, let's see how this looks like. So now basically four dots were color coded and now they, they start moving.
and now it stops. And the question would be, what was this one of the 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 dots uh, to be observed? And actually, if if you were able to track this, the answer was yes. Now, basically here, uh, the next one. Okay, so we are we're not going to spend the whole presentation with just observing these dots, but I think you get the idea what um, what this is about. A quite demanding task, yeah. Where really, if we don't pay attention, if we, our attention slips, then actually um, it is not possible to really do this task. Okay, so what were and we did the same task just to briefly say before the, the training and then the participants engaged for eight weeks with mindfulness or the uh, relaxation training and then we did the same task again. So what we found is in terms of accuracy, yes, so correctly saying whether the, this final dot, the green dot at the end, whether it was one of the target dots or not, it increased significantly after meditation, but not uh, for the control group. So now when we look at the steady state brain response that we recorded with EEG, then it looks quite interesting here. The red uh, line is for the meditators, the black lines are for the control group. And if we uh, uh, separate them, what we see very clearly that yeah, the dotted line is before the training and the solid line is after the training. Over the eight second period, we see a clear reduction of this steady state response, whereas in the control group, there is no uh, consistent change, neither an increase nor, nor a decrease um, from before to, to after the meditation. Yeah? So in addition to the increased accuracy, what we see actually it now condensed over the whole eight second period, what we see is that in the meditation group, the, the steady state, state response is much reduced. And what we, what we interpret, what this means is actually that the participants in the meditation group, that they need less, few or fewer neural resources to do the task even better than before. Yeah? So, or in brief, so that fewer neural resources need to be involved to do, have even better uh, performance. Yeah? So, and so we think that this is actually an indication also that the, on the one hand that their sustained attention improves. Yeah, this is what we can see in general as a, because of the increase in task performance and accuracy, and that this improvement is actually achieved by fine-tuning the, the involved uh, brain networks so that fewer neural resources are re uh, really have to get involved in it. So in addition to sustained attention, we what I talked already a little bit about is that metacognitive aspects are where we think that they also uh, might improve, you know, so that actually being aware of one's own uh, cognitive attentional states would be an important aspect of meditation as well. Now, this is actually, a, I think, a very important construct. And if you're really interested in this, I can only recommend this uh, model. I didn't uh, list it at the be beginning before. It's a little bit more complex. It's a uh, model developed by Isbell and Summers um, from the Sunshine Coast University in Australia. And it contains many important aspects. It puts, I th in a smart way, I think it puts a working memory quite centrally. It considers the role of equanimity and of positive or uh, positive emotional states so that uh, emotional states that enhance equanimity, disruptive emotional states, mind wandering, the, the role of insight you know, that arises from, from the meditation practice. But what I am interested in here is in particular this point you know, where I think the, this, the um, fine detail that they focus on here is, is very meaningful. 
where, where they actually split metacognition into three components. Yeah? So met metacognitive experience, metacognitive knowledge, and metacognitive skills. Yeah? And, that, and these are then uh, involved in particular with control processes and monitoring processes. And this is what I'm going to focus on now, but just to, to uh, say once more that this is part of a larger model. Yeah? So we're working memory, attention, insight, equanimity, and, and things like this are uh, also involved. But, but as we want to focus on metacognition now, I will zoom in a little bit more. Yeah? So this basically these three components where when, when Isbell and Summers talk about metacognitive experience, this is really about um, the experience of the meditator, the, the monitoring of one's own cognitive processes and the actual experience of this. Then on the other hand, metacognitive skills, it is the ability, the skill set that, that we have, that someone has to really apply strategies to control one, one's own uh, cognitive states and uh, behaviors and so on. We may also want to call this um, executive attention and control. Some people would, would call it like this. And in the middle sits metacognitive knowledge. So, and this actually also includes that one knows about task instructions, about the different strategies, about the goals and all this, that one is aware of this, basically the wider context and the specific instructions of the meditation practice. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, but what, we are, what I'm interested in here now is actually two aspects of monitoring. Yeah, so if we are monitor our, uh, our own performance, for instance, and on our own behavior. So one can, one can observe whether in my task performance, actually I am still on goal. This would be one aspect. Another aspect of uh, monitoring would be to, uh, to monitor whether I respond accurately or not. Now, when it comes to control processes, that's for instance, the ability to override, yeah, to, to stop and respond in a different way when a certain response has been triggered. Yeah? Or another aspect of control would be to inhibit a certain response. And I list these four because we tested these four. There are other aspects of, of this as well. But the data I'm going to show you is actually first the, uh, the control processes and then the monitoring processes that we've actually tested in a, using a similar approach to what I showed before. So basically that we train people in med meditation, tested them before and, and after. Yeah, so, and there I, I will run you through four different studies. Uh, one of them, well, for a start, we first did a cross-sectional study. This was one of the first studies I, I did at all in, in this field. But, but then the main thing are, three studies. The first one where people meditated for just three weeks, a simple mindful breath awareness meditation as before, and we compared them to a waitlist control group. The second study was for eight weeks, same meditation, just one meditation, not a set of meditations and not a full mindfulness-based program for all of these studies. Yeah? And here we com com uh, compare it to an active control a group of participants who engaged in cognitive brain training with uh, some training exercises that one can buy in the, in the bookstore that are uh, promoted as improving cognitive performance. And here we were, we were working with older participants. We were interested in, in finding out whether cognitive improvements can also be achieved in older participants. And then the, la the last study I'm going to talk about as well, uh, people practiced for 16 weeks, the same meditation, and then compared to a weightless control group. And in this case, actually, we had three test uh, points. So at the beginning, after eight weeks, and after 16 weeks, and in the others, just at the beginning and mm, at the end. 
three weeks, eight weeks, 16 weeks. So if, if it comes to inhibitory control, one of the most commonly used paradigms for this, many will, maybe everyone will know, is the so-called Stroop paradigm, where the participants have the task to name you know, or respond to the color, different color words are printed in. In which in the congruent condition where re red is printed in red, brown in brown, and so on, this is easy, but the diff more difficult incongruent condition is where the word red is printed in a different color, for instance, in green and so on, or the word brown in blue, and where we where, uh, participants usually experience interference and may make um, mistakes also because the automaticity of reading words, if, if you know the language is, at least, is, um, is very strong. And in this cross-sectional study, what we found is first of all, when we gave participants, we also gave participants a mindfulness questionnaire and we found that the, the meditators that we compared to a matched control group, that the meditators scored higher in the mindfulness questionnaire than the control group. And, but the interesting finding was that the meditators made fewer mistakes in this uh, Stroop task than, um, than the control group. And also then if we correlate, right, well, basically we, uh, we expand this data a bit more. If we correlate uh, the mindfulness scores with the, the number of Stroop errors, we see actually a quite strong correlation and, and basically reflecting what we see here is that we have fewer mistakes and higher mindfulness here in, in the meditators, the red dots, and more mistakes, lower mindfulness in the blue dots, basically just spread out what we have here on the right again. Yeah, but an indication that something is something relevant might be happening there. But as you know, of course, from correlation, we cannot conclude a causation. That's why we need all the different, that we need the longitudinal intervention studies to really find um, some differences there. Okay, so in all the studies now, the intervention studies, three, eight, 16 weeks of training that I'm going to share with you now, we uh, the we gave the participants different cognitive tests and at the same time recorded their EEG. And in this case, we were looking at the event-related potentials. I guess because Ryle, he's, he's doing so much work with it, many of you will be familiar with it, but so I just keep it very brief what this is. So participants sit on the, in front of the computer screen here in, 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 the, in, in this case in an uh, electrically shielded uh, chamber with a, with a screen outside. But, um, and then we record uh, the brain activity. And uh, I mean, this is now a schematic, very uh, simplified, but what we find is that in relation to a certain event, we are usually uh, in many cases, it is the onset of a stimulus, you know, visual stimulus, for ex example, we get a brain response that goes down and up and down and up and down and up and, and so on over, you know, usually we're interested in the first five, six, 700 milliseconds there in a simple task. And yeah, so, and we always relate this to an event. And so, and then the, we, these, Peaks are called the P, so the positive peaks are called P, so the P2, P3, or in this case, P600, so a peak around 600 milliseconds, so they can either be counted, the second, the third, and so on, or they are indicated by the time in milliseconds when they appeared. And then one can also look at where they appeared on, on the scalp. Yeah, so what you see here is actually the nose and two ears, and such a peak might appear very much at the back of the head, at the front of the head, and then one can interpret the topographies and so on. Yeah, I mean, this is all schematic here. It never looks as clean as it is presented here. And the same one can do with the negative peaks, and then they are called N1, N2, and so on, but the same idea. And we can either look at when this happens yeah, and consider shifts in the latency 
yeah, de depending on the condition, or we can consider shifts in the amplitude. And in all the data that I'm going to present, I'm focusing on, on changes in the amplitude as a result of, of meditation. Yeah. So, and the first data basically here, these are the brain responses in relation to the Stroop task, basically a similar task to what I a computerized, similar task to what I showed you before with the color words. And what we see is actually that the N2 component, so the second negativity, you can see this here, it's, it's very, very pronounced here, that this was actually affected by meditation. And what we, what we see here in red, uh, the meditation group, yeah, so they're not quite matched yeah, in, in terms of the EEG response. But what we see here is that there's a slight increase in the meditation group and, but there's, and a decrease in blue for the control group over a period of 16 weeks. And sometimes it's easier to, to see what is really go, going on if we subtract the, di the different um, conditions and look at the topographies. And what we see here is from the end of the study minus the beginning of the study, so time point three minus time point one. And what we see here in the control group that actually here, especially at the back for congruent trials, uh, congruent words and incongruent words, uh, almost the same, but what we see is actually the, the red here, what, what means that the negativity was uh, reduced. Yeah, so less negative, and whereas the opposite pattern appears here in the meditation group. And when we look at where roughly we can't locate it very well with EEG, but where in the meditation group where this effect was broadly located was in particular in the left inferior, inferior occipital temporal areas where we know color is processed and also especially in the left hemisphere also word, uh, word stimuli are processed so this might be relevant for the particular stimuli especially in the second negativity uh, in, in the second negative component, and then in the third positive component, the P3, what we find is, and if, is particularly the case posterior, so at the, at the uh, back part of, of the scalp, in particular for the incongruent condition. And what is interesting here is that from T1 to T2, basically no difference really appeared between meditators and non-meditators. So after eight weeks, there was still no difference. But then after 16 weeks, we see a very clear drop of the P3 amplitude only for the meditators, not in blue, not for the control condition. And what we see is that this effect in particular is located in right occipital temporal areas. Yeah. And so and we know from other research not related to meditation that this P3 component is particularly uh, uh, in relevant or an indicator of, um, of this ability to override an automatic or prepotent response, the, the automatic reading, whereas the N2 component that we saw before is particularly involved in in selective attention, yeah, so paying attention to stimulus itself. And what we also found is actually that the more, the larger the change in the N2 was, so the more the N2 was increased, become higher amplitude, the more the P3 was reduced. Yeah, so it, it seems almost as if the people, if they were able to pay more attention, more focused attention to the to the word stimulus, the, the fewer re resources, neural resources were required yeah, to, to override the automatic response as indicated by the P3. Yeah, so an indicator actually of, of this um, metacognitive skill to over to override uh, an automatic response. 
Now then, uh, the next study looks at not overriding, but completely stopping or inhibiting uh, a response. Yeah, And a typical task that is used for this is the so-called go-no-go task. In the simplest case, for instance, here, participants are shown a traffic light. They have to press a button when the traffic light is green, and they have to not press a button when the uh, traffic light is red. And so to to force almost some errors, one makes the go stimuli, so the green traffic light, one makes them more likely than the no-go stimuli. For instance, in, in this case, 75% were green traffic lights and only 25% red traffic lights. Would be nice to have this in real life as well when we're driving on the street. Yeah, so, okay, but this was the, the, the task. And what in this case, what we are particularly interested in, these are not real data, just to show you how the brain response tends to look like, is that in these so-called no-go trials, you know, when we have such as, uh, unlike, uh, uneven probabilities, then what we see is this uh, P3 response is much enlarged compared to, to go trials. Yeah? So in particular, when... The, the automatic response of pressing the button needs to be stopped the, in the no-goal tr no trials, then we see this P3, and so we see it as an index of inhibiting uh, an automatic response, stopping responding. And what we see here in particular is, well, maybe not. I'm not going to all the data, but what is particularly interesting here is that in the, if we look at in frontal areas of this P3 components, after only three weeks of training, we see that the, there is a difference appearing uh, frontally in, uh, in frontal electrodes for yeah, in, in the meditation condition but compared to the, to the control group. And is what we what is also what we see here is actually actually that the difference topography go go no go is so here before me, before the training and then here after the training that this really starts to de develop so it looks like there might be uh, improved response inhibition after only three weeks uh, of training. Yeah, but but this effect it is just significant, so um, not very strong. It might also be that it requires more than three weeks of meditation training. In another study, we used we, now with our older participants over eight weeks, we used the similar paradigms, but, but paradigm, but in this case with letter stimuli and the. Uh, the uh, probabilities were slightly shifted. There are some reasons for it, but I'm not going into the details now. And what we find there is that actually in the meditation group, so before the training is a solid line and after the training is a dashed line, what, what we see here that after eight weeks of meditation training with older participants, the amplitude is reduced. Uh, whereas in the control group, in the active control group, the, there's a, a tendency that the, that the P3 responds over uh, again here over frontal and central areas that this is um, decreased. And so there we see again this um, metacognitive skill of inhibiting a response that this seems to be developing through meditation practice. Now, when it comes to monitoring yeah? so on, on the other side of the diagram so now um, also with our older participants so the same study but with a different task that we also did is a is a variation of this Stroop task and in this case it's a emotional counting Stroop or incongruency task and the stimuli that we used were basically um, words on the screen. And the participants only had to indicate whether there was one word, two words, three words, or four words. So one, two, three, or four. These were the four possible responses. But then basically 
in the incongruent condition, the, the words that were presented were number words. Yeah? So two in this case could be one, could be three, and so on. Yeah? In another condition, the negative words appeared. In another condition, positive word, uh, words appears, appeared. And in a neutral condition, then neutral words appeared. Yes? And what we found in general that this manipulation of the content of the words had an effect on the on the responses on, also on on the on the brain response yeah so the manipulation of yeah so we, we try to bring in a control component but also we we try to bring in an emotional component here in principle as an experimental manipulation it worked but it didn't have any effect or any specific effect, or it wasn't these responses, let's put it the other way around, were in no way influenced by meditation practice. Yeah. So that's why I now make the results very simplified, averaged across all these four conditions, because although in themselves they made a difference, these, dif these different conditions were, or the changes that we observed did not depend on these uh, different conditions. But what we did find is actually that the N2, the, the second negative component, front to central again, was uh, influenced by meditation practice. And this is what we see here very clearly. The N2, yes, so solid line is before the training, that dashed line after the training. So after eight weeks of mindfulness training, we see that the amplitude of the N2 is much enlarged. And what we see in the in the active control group, the the tendency is the opposite. It goes in the other direction and the same is actually then observed. If we look at the topographies here, not differences, but but actual topographies here, it becomes more negative. Yeah, from before to, to after the training, whereas no such change is observed in the, in the control group. Now, there we also try to calculate where this effect actually is located in the brain. Well, we can't be very precise with, with EEG. It doesn't, well, there are technical limitations to how well we can estimate where the signal comes from in the brain. But we, it looks like that in particular, the right angular gyrus is, is the source where, where the, the main difference uh, appears yeah? from, from before to after the training and, as, and as there was no difference and also nothing for here really for the brain training group. And so, and then if we, look, if we kind of post hoc in this case, it wasn't quite what we were looking for in, in the data we were trying to manipulate emotional states and so on, as I tried to explain. So it's a kind of a post hoc explanation, but what we think, what it might mean is actually that, so looking more closely what this N2 component in such paradigms, what it reflects and what the right angular gyrus tends to be involved in, what we think is actually that this might be an indicator of improved goal maintenance. Yeah? So that the, that the ability to stay on task, to stay with the goal might be improved as uh, through the, the mm, mindfulness practice. Now, so this would be an, one aspect of the monitoring function. Now, the final, uh, final study and the final thing to consider here is uh, monitoring in terms of monitoring one's own performance or in this case response accuracy and there's research that actually shows EEG research that there's a clear EEG response when we become um, yeah when I'm almost through with the slides um, when we become aware of um, having made a mistake. Yeah, so, and this is the so-called error-related negativity. And in general, now, just to, to point out here in this uh, 
in this uh, graph, negative is plotted upwards. Some colleagues prefer it like this and positive is plotted downwards. Yep. So this is actually a negative, negative peak here. This is the time point when a particip participants press a button although they should not have. Yeah? So they made a mistake and then when they become aware of the mistake, this error related negativity, a negative peak you know, within the first 100 milliseconds after a button press appears. There's a, a study by um, Tepper and Inslick who actually show that Comparing meditators with control with a control group, they show that the, this ERN in, in one study is enhanced in meditators compared to a control condition. Yes. So there was some reason to think that maybe also in meditation, uh, as a result of engaging in meditation, this might be uh, changed. And so basically now we look at the same data we looked at before with a go no go task but what we are now interested in is these these trials where the participants pressed the button although the traffic light was red although these were no go trials yeah? so error and then we look at the error related negativity and we uh, still plot negative downwards so what we see here is actually blue line before the training and red line after the training, we see that the ERN gets larger, yeah? and this might mean a larger awareness of having made a mistake, similar to the uh, study, uh, the cross-sectional study by Tepper and Inslick, where they showed a larger ERN yeah, in meditators compared to controls, and such change here in the control group from, from before to after did not appear, if anything, it went in the opposite uh, direction, but not significantly. Yeah, okay, this is, so and if, so here we see the, the same effect summarized in meditation, the ERN amplitude becomes more negative in the control group, group after three weeks, not, and what we also see is actually this difference here. If we plot it here, then we see that the the change was larger. Yeah, so more negative here. The the more hours or minutes, sorry, not hours. This was actually it was a very short study, just of three uh, weeks. The more minutes people had engaged in meditation in the participants the stronger this change was. So this was also uh, strongly correlated here, the change, so more negative amplitude with the amount of meditation practice. Okay, and this was the, the last uh, data I wanted to show, just briefly to summarize. So there's some evidence that meditation improves the, the ability to override automatic or preponent responses, that um, uh, response inhibition is improved, that this is more post hoc, but it may well be that the ability to stay on goal, to maintain a goal in a task, that this improves, and then also that performance monitoring improves as well. That's basically what we showed with, with these uh, data. So, and before the other study with the uh, moving objects task, uh, uh, indication that sustained attention improves. So just, so I, and we, sh we showed that various aspects of this metacognitive functions improve. And just as a reminder, what participants did, they just focused in meditation for usually for 10 minutes a day for a few weeks, focused on the breath in a mindful way, non-judgmental, accepting way. And as a result, their performance and brain activity in the cognitive tests improved. Yeah. So what the cognitive processes engaged during training generalize to neural activity and performance outside of training. Yeah? And again, just to, to emphasize once more that we are talking about three weeks, eight weeks, 16 weeks of training. So very, very early effect where probably participants still engage a lot of effort in the meditation practice. Yeah? But what we see is actually that the first 
cognitive improvements uh, appear quite rapidly. So maybe just briefly, that's not the only research we are doing. So what's next? So we are, at the moment, we are looking at a massive data set with very experienced meditators and two studies already published where we we did all kinds of things. We tortured them with, with uh, thermal stimuli. We gave them emotional pictures. We recorded their brain activity during meditation and, and basically really look at cognitive processes and, and emotional processes in very experienced meditators during different meditation uh, conditions and, and so on. We are about to launch a study where we want to start tracking meditators in daily life over longer time periods and develop uh, or still developing a smartphone app for making it easy for participants to report this. And we're also trying to improve ways or find better ways of measuring mindfulness beyond mindfulness questionnaires. So a lot of the, the other things that are going on, but I, I didn't want to talk about all of this now. Okay, so I rattled through the, these slides. I hope there was uh, something interesting in there for you. We, I tried to present a kind of coherent way of the, one of the mainstreams of the, the research we have been doing in, in Liverpool in, in relation to mindfulness and cognitive processes. And you may have some, so thank you for your thank you. attention. And if this you have any great. questions. Yeah, um, I certainly have some and my attention was, uh, didn't waver because I'm very familiar with your techniques. I, I don't know if we will find the same thing for all of our, uh, our participants, but let's first just um, open it up for any uh, questions. You can either press the raise hand icon or enter something into the Q and A. Um, and uh, and I will uh, call on you uh, or ask your question that you enter in there. Um, in the meantime, uh, I'd like to start with um, one thing. You know, I, I'm quite. I've become quite familiar with these go no go ERN effects that you published. Um, as you mentioned, uh, Tepper and Inslet were the first to publish these ERN findings in relationship to meditation and mindfulness. Um, and a number of other groups have, uh, have found both in cross-sectional studies and intervention studies, um, you know, consistently, there's this increase of ERN that seems to be associated with uh, mindfulness training. Uh, one of the more interesting things as I was getting into that literature was to also note um, the uh, fairly significant and robust uh, finding that anxiety disorders um, uh, are also associated with enhanced ERN amplitudes. So I was just curious if you looked at any correlations between anxiety measures in your participants and the ERN effects and or had any thoughts about that uh, somewhat paradoxical kind of finding in the, in the field. So the first, uh, the first part is easy to answer, no. Uh -huh. <laughs> so we, because we, we didn't include any particular uh, anxiety measures in the study. So we, we only, in all these studies that I showed you, we only worked or only worked with so-called healthy participants. And we were, we, it's, I mean, as you know, it's always a question how much you can burden your participants and you just have to make choices where, how many questionnaires and, and things to give. So we, we, beyond, sometimes we included uh, just a simple PANA, so uh, just effective states or so, but, but not really getting into anxiety or depressive symptoms or, or something like this, because th these studies were, we really try to focus on the, on the cognitive processes. So in a way, it's always a shame when you hear, oh, if we just had included this one further questionnaire or something like this. But okay, at some point, you just, you have to make choices and you, and so we didn't include this. So I can't say so, so much about it. And 
So maybe, I'm, I'm maybe not I'll clinical. just I'll share my uh, my intuition. Maybe it might yeah. pr uh, provoke something in your analysis of, of this data in the future, or, or if you obtain these measures again, that it. it so, you know, the, the, in the clinical literature, the way it's described is, you know, with anxiety disorders, um, people are uh, monitoring their own behaviors to an excessive degree. Yeah. And yeah. this kind of uh, incessant uh, kind of hyper monitoring of their behavior is indexed by, um, you know, this enhanced ERN and also kind of reflective of this kind of, you know, never quite being sure that you're doing the right thing and kind of anxiously kind of uh, hyper-focused on whether you are or not. So um, one of the thoughts a... that I had about it is just, you know, the, 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 the unique thing about mindfulness training is that you are enhancing the monitoring of your own, you know, covert and over behaviors through these kinds of practices but it's done with a very explicit, you know, acceptance uh, of oh, yeah. whatever you're doing. And so, you know, there may be a real interesting dissociation uh, between the I mean, ARN amplitude changes. That's, that's so important um, that, I mean, and thank you for, for highlighting this, that we, we don't take some cognitive changes as a, as a yardstick at, as the most important. They need to, I, I mean, if we want to, get beneficial outcomes they need to be embedded in something more important yeah so i mean just to be able to pay attention or to monitor you now monitor one's own performance or something like this can be quite dysfunctional if okay. if it is not embedded in uh, as you say in in, in the right attitude yes and i think i mean what what comes to mind is that what we also see sometimes in with with mindfulness questionnaires for instance with the ffmq the five facet mindfulness questionnaire well i mean some people that say the observing subscale doesn't always behave in the way how we want yeah so where we we think that in general the ability to observe and it's quite similar to the monitoring function i guess here to observe one's own mental state is is useful but it can actually, if you if you're prone to ruminating, to catastrophizing, and so on, it can be quite dysfunctional as well. So if we only take observing on its own, you know, if we only take the ability to monitor one's own mental states and processes and responses and what have you on on its own, this is not mindfulness. This is not beneficial. It it always requires more and. Yeah, thank you for highlighting this. And of course, if one goes so strong with in one direction with the, with the research, there is the risk that one it, it dis, almost distorts things if one forgets the, the, the bigger picture there. And it, it's in, it's incredibly important. And when we are, I would say, when we are when we are teaching mindfulness, when we are then this aspect needs needs to be there it, it might be i mean it's I, I don't know if one can speculate in this way in the end uh, for the beneficial effects certainly the accepting non-judging component or that and you may talk about decentering and and things like this is or equanimity if we go a bit further is more important than than the metacognition, but 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 probably one needs some metacognition for these for the other functions to to also function well. So they interact, you know, But they, I'm not. I mean, maybe I'm going too far there. Should, but should I just say a few more words? From sure, I'm, yeah, I'm sometimes. I think it's a, it, but certainly, you know, what you're speaking to, I'll just kind of contextualize from my perspective a bit. Is you know the, the uh, conundrum, and um, you know, uh, it's kind of like a, a questioning of our of our own um, 
the usefulness of our own work that those of us in the neuroscience of mindfulness, you know, uh, must uh, confront as we engage in this kind of work, which is, you know, as we focus in on different neural uh, possible, um, you know, correlates or underpinnings to the effects of, of mindfulness, are we focusing on something that in the end actually, uh, you know, is, is beneficial to, uh, to the way the mind works and the way that these practices can really be of most mm -hmm. benefit? Or are we kind of taking attention away from what's most beneficial, which is lived experience and putting it onto the brain and kind of, you know, encouraging a, uh, a miscategorization within, um, you know, the common understanding of this stuff so that we're kind of saying, oh, it's all about your brain instead of, you know, keeping the focus where it, it's maybe most appropriate. And I think, you know, just speaking to that topic it, to a greater extent, it, 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 would, it would be great to hear your, your further thoughts on that. Well, this that's, I mean, now, now you widen it even, <laughs> even further and, And that's, you can approach it from so many different perspectives. And I don't think that there is a, just a very clear cut, cut answer. So now if I, from my perspective as a, as a meditation, as, as a meditator and as a meditation teacher, I don't need any brain science whatsoever. If, I mean, if I look at my own meditation practice, there was a time where it disturbed me. So if I, st when I, I wanted to meditate and I started thinking about all kinds of things, what might be happening and so not particularly helpful. And the, the real conviction personally for me that meditation makes a difference do doesn't come from any EEG data or something like this, but it comes from my experience that I see in my life, that I see in the life of other people, that meditation makes a difference. So in this sense, it's it's not needed. On, on the other hand, so if we ex ex accept that we we live in a, in a society where scientific inquiry counts, then I think it's perfectly fine that we that we use the scientific method to scrutinize the different approaches we have. And as long as we don't make the mistake to, to only think about brain activity and so on and forget about the experience, I think that that's also okay. And it can also help if we kind of accept that the scientific, let's say third person approach makes sense at all, then it also can give us some insights from that perspective. It, it shouldn't be a contradiction. It, I think it's just if we overemphasize it. At the same time, it seems that some people get get more trust in meditation if they see brain data. <laughs> Let's say like this. Yeah? How long this will last if it if it do doesn't change your experience? I I I think it will not last long, but it can open maybe also the door for some people. It can, and if we if we work with meditation within the scientific uh, psychological context, then we have to be able to also to describe it in this way. In a way, it's maybe it's just a new way of looking something and rediscovering and covering what is already there. Yeah. I don't know. I, um, I, I certainly um, find myself agreeing with many of your uh, sentiments and interpretations um and uh we should probably cut it short there also because it is 1 30. oh is um, it okay yes yeah. <laughs> um but really i just want to thank you so much for for joining us and uh and sharing you know some some fairly sophisticated brain uh data underlying the uh the the changes in, in cognition associated with, with mindfulness training with us and um, 
For those uh, who are not aware, we will have another talk in, in two weeks on, on Tuesday. Um, uh, Judd Brewer will be joining us and be speaking about mindfulness in relationship to uh, anxiety and uh, habit change. And um, this will be co-sponsored by the Department of Psychiatry Grand Rounds at that time. Um, so in the meantime, thank you very much Peter, for joining us. Yeah. Thank and, you. It uh, was a it was a real pleasure. I hope it is somehow useful. It was certainly useful for me, and I'm sure okay. others agree. <laughs>